those kind of things that happen, like today being the first day of Leo and Haile Selassie's birthday today, I just put that yeah. together. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, I have a little brother. He was born on, or he, yeah, he celebrates August 17th. And he's square Leo. So this <laughs> makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> and I go back and forth. He's the baby. <laughs> cool. 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 Well, thank you for having coming on. I'm here with uh Kaioki, ladies and gentlemen, living in Southern Oregon. And he's writing a bunch of these books. And the one that I've read recently here is uh Processing Our Collective Trauma. And I kept this sitting around here on my table. And every time I put on my music and start feeling the, the you know, good fight back vibrations, I pick this up and say, I got to do something. Singing isn't going to do it. So I read this. And this book was very inspirational. Um, I don't know if it, I think every white person that reads this is going to take a different aspect from it, handle it differently. Um, I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> I did. <laughs> Thank you tremendously for that introduction. That was fantastic, Adam. That was fantastic. Thank you. Tell, tell, us, tell us about yourself. Well, I am the byproduct of the second wave of migration out of the South of my family. And so I was born and raised in Anchorage, Alaska. In 1974, when I was born, Anchorage was only 50,000 strong and was still mostly wilderness. When I left in 2018, it was 301,000 person strong. So it grown sixfold. And it is the most multicultural city in the United States of America with Minneapolis being number two, and I think like Austin or Houston surprisingly being number three, and a section of New York being number four. Multiculturalism is different than diversity, and it's something that I've been learning here in Southern Oregon has to be articulated. Multiculturalism means that in the same neighborhood, like where, like Mountain View, you'll have somebody who's Yupik living next to somebody from Somalia, living next to somebody from, uh, who originated in Southeast, uh, like Vietnam, Asia. And when I say living next to, if you go into a Somali household, they may not have tables and chairs. They are not attempting to assimilate to the American Western standard. They may not eat a hamburger or pizza. They're not trying to find common ground in the American culture. So the child that goes into that household who isn't Somali or who isn't Hmong or who isn't Yupik, they get exposed to a totally different way to be human. And they learn that they're not gonna be rejected. They're not gonna be oppressed. They're not gonna have low self-esteem in the presence of those family, but they do learn there's more than one way. I do not have to be you for you to be safe. That's the whole point behind multiculturalism. Multiculturalism was crafted for all those generations after segregation because everybody was practicing white supremacy until we get to the civil rights movement. That's my father's childhood. So I'm Gen X. My father's Gen 9. Dr. King and Malcolm X would be Gen 8. Their parents would be Gen uh, 7, like Selassie. So Selassie's born in 19, nine, uh, 1892. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who's Malcolm X's teacher, is born in 1897. You've got Daddy King in the same time period before 900, uh, Malcolm's father before 900. And so that's Generation 7. That, uh, that generation came up with the solution to white supremacy, how to walk out of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've been working on since the civil rights movement. Civil rights movement gets started not on December 1st, 1955, but on May 17th, 1954, when Thurgood Marshall in front of the Supreme Court successfully gets desegregation of the schools. It is the integration of our childhood, of our childhoods, 
that differentiate us from every other generation. That means JFK doesn't know what we're talking about. Oh. Bobby Kennedy doesn't know what we're talking about. LBJ and everybody before then, they really don't know what we're talking about. We are in absolutely new territory. Okay. So when I was 21 years old, because of the background and everything that I have, my father, for my particular rites of passage, sends me off to this small gathering called the Million Man March. And I'm there with two million other black men. There is not one fight right. with two million black men. Right. Minister Louis Farrakhan calls this quote unquote controversial march in order for us to take an oath to return back to our communities and make them a better place. It does not matter what the opposition that we were dealing with. It didn't, we weren't trying to convince people that we deserve life like we're doing with the Black Lives Matter movement. We were going back and made the oath to go back and do what is necessary in order to make our communities better, period, okay? So since then, for the last 27 years, I have faithfully been a community organizer. And uh, in 2018, I took those skill set here to Southern Oregon and got invited by four young geniuses to the Beloved Music Festival. The Beloved Music Festival is a homegrown Oregonian festival. And the purpose of it is to help people go on their healing journey. Okay. You go there, there's music and workshops. Nice. I was brought in in elder status, right? Because right? these were early 20 year olds. Elder status to help hold space for a sanctuary, a BIPOC sanctuary, B-I-P-O-C, Black Indigenous People of Color. And no white people were allowed inside the sanctuary. It was there to help BIPOC recover. Right. Because the great majority of BIPOC, the only experience they have being around 3,000 white people in the woods are horror films. Yeah. So they were completely going over their heads. So we ended up creating the space where they could recover and then join in the festival authentically as themselves, just like in multiculturalism. Right. I was like, you know what? Here's an idea that works. <laughs> <laughs> so decided to go back to Southern Oregon and got with the Unitarian uh, um, Universalist Fellowship, Rogue Valley Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, and asked them to be a fiscal sponsor. And I wrote up my experience, put it up on my blog, the... Um, Pastor read it, said, yes, this is exactly what we want. And so since then, since January 2020, that's what we've been building. It is extremely practical. When I say extremely practical, uh, this last two days, there's a Native American elder who's extremely active in the community. She comes on a thread on Messenger on Facebook and is talking about the Klamath Reservation and some of the things that they need. And I was able to get in contact with them immediately and say, what would you do with $500? And they told me, and I said, okay, we'll cut a check. And they came back and there were uh, some shut shutoff notices and gave me two shutoff notices. And we were like, okay, cool. Uh, I may have to make a phone call to let them know that you know the, the money's coming, but we got that. The thing yeah. is, is that it was culturally relevant. She's a native elder. She right. literally just is supposed to just speak the word and then see the action happen. It isn't, I filled out this application form. I jumped through this hoop. I had to talk to four other people. It's literally, Kokai, here's what's going on. And then I go, yes, ma'am. <laughs> That's exactly what's supposed to happen. So they're ecstatic about that. Um, Surge, Stand Up for Racial Justice, is a group here in Eugene. So I'm traveling up and down the I-5. And so currently I'm in Eugene with the new titles. Um, so you got that one processing our collective trauma, um, police crimes against black folk. Uh, I have when and where we feel safe, which is the write up of beloved, um, emotional labor, the message of an organic black intellectual. That uh, is a set of essays from the political work the, uh, in Ashland. We just passed a racial and social equity commission. And then I'm a part of the truth and conciliation council. And those are two innovations coming out of the uh, brainstorm of the mayor, um, Julie Aikens, who's absolutely phenomenal yeah. and taking a tremendous amount of heat as they help the community 
confront race, racism, and whiteness because it's a taboo subject, right. but address it in like humanity because there seems to be some kind of crashing that happens in the psychology where the white person believes that we're trying to hurt them yeah. with race, racism, and whiteness instead of, okay, here's the reality that we're working in. You're walking around as if it's not impacting your life when that's not true. Right. And so the last one is um, Surviving Springfield, uh, Seven Insights into Anti-Racism work. In February for Black History Month, I came up with my love letter campaign, which went viral over Now This in 2018. Yeah. Okay. So there's like a Now This uh, Good Morning profile with 1.7 million views. Yeah. So I was approaching the end of that project of 10,000 handwritten love letters because I got tired of the negativity in the country. And oh. since I took the oath at the um, Million Man March, I decided to do some positivity on the ground. Nice. I got to Springfield and learned that Springfield has some recalcitrant ideas. Let's say it like that. Okay. <laughs> and I wrote that up and then did the seven insights and that's what we're distributing right now. And nice. Springfield and Eugene are like twin cities, just like um, St. Paul and Minneapolis. Right. So you, can all, you almost can't tell where one ends and one begins because they're twin cities. So that's what we've been doing. Um, I have a degree in American history and minor in Western philosophy. Um, I come from a mystical family. My mother is um, a pastor in Las Vegas. My dad is a practitioner in uh, the Ernest Holmes School of Thought for a New Thought in Alaska. And I think we've been on the cutting edge when it comes to facilitating human growth and development. I mean, all my life, all their lives. This book that's, hits that's, it, that's, man. This book was written so well because it's like, it doesn't matter what stage you are in as a, as a white person. It doesn't matter if you're just now hearing, you know, the very first time that most white people heard Black Lives Matter. They got a backfire effect. I know I did. And then, I mean, I'm, I've moved way past that now, but this book still was great for me. So I don't think it matters where you are in learning and waking up. It could be the very beginning or it could be near the end. Either you're going to be hearing this and it's not, you're not going to like what you read or you're going to laugh and love what you read. But either way, it's evolution. And uh, let me, how about this medium here? Do you still do the, your medium? Yes, yes, I do still do medium. The latest article was um, my experience in Gold Hill. And Gold Hill, Oregon is just outside of Medford or the quote unquote Rogue Valley. And there's 1,500 people who live in Gold Hill. And they have a one school that I know of, an elementary school. And I was passing out flyers, um, advertising the latest book, Surviving Springfield. And I come across the mascot of this elementary school. And I'm looking at this picture and I like took a picture of it and I sent it to the members of the sanctuary. And I'm like, uh, do you guys see what I see? And they go like, yeah, we see what you see. And what it is is a cartoon presentation of the Pink Panther in blackface. <laughs> and they call themselves the Panthers. And I'm like, uh, this is oh, Gold Hill. Oh, yeah. I can understand exactly. the Elks. Mm -hmm. oh. I can understand the Ravens. I can understand the Salmon. I can understand the Trout. I can understand the Miners. It's Gold Hill. There were Miners there. Right, right, right. But Panthers? Mm. Wow, this was a sundown town, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, we had another experience in Cresswell which is just outside of Eugene. And for July 4th, there was a Proud Boy Parade. Okay. And so what I've learned in, 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 in communicating across the various platforms that mm -hmm. when it comes to this taboo subject, it is best indirect because then the person doesn't feel like their particular personality is being attacked. Uh -huh. So like with the processing book, I start off with a police crime and it's completely internal to the Samoan community. It yeah. is a Samoan police officer killing a Samoan father. Okay, yes. Okay, so now if that's happening in a multicultural city, then there's a problem with the police period and police culture. Exactly. So you go, okay. Yes. <laughs> period. 
Then I march us all the way with the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement, which was the Malcolm X grassroots movement, which was keeping track of when black people were being killed. Yeah. I was in Minneapolis in 2013 when Terrence Mookie Franklin was uh, murdered by police. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and the talk about Minneapolis him. police ran in to his grandmother's house down to the basement to kill him. Yeah. Okay. And then it, it ends with the 20th anniversary of the Million Man March because, again, there had to be a renewal of commitment to implementing the solution instead of just constantly talking about the problem because we do have the capacity to address the problems by implementing solutions. And most people are like, I don't know where to begin. You begin by getting centered with yourself. That's where you have the breathing exercises and the request for you to fortify yourself, um, right. quote, unquote, spiritually. Then show up. That's what it is. There's, there's, there's something that we've developed and it's called the Rosa Parks rule. That means when injustice crosses your path, you change it. And it doesn't matter what the consequences are. You don't choose to follow the evil order. It stops at your desk. Yeah. What does that mean? Um, I was talking to um, a friend who's in the school district or one of the school districts in Southern Oregon. And I asked, in June, hey, uh, are you guys teaching about pride? And they go, oh, I wish. What do you mean you wish? Well, we want to deal with the parents. And in my mind, I'm like, teach the parents too then. <laughs> That's how well, what is it. the problem? Yeah. Why are you scared of, the, if you're already taking care of their children and teaching their children, why are you scared of their parents? And the parents' reaction, I could lose my job. Okay, what that mean? Who else they gonna have to teach them? Do you get, you, we throw away our power, okay? There are no elites. One of the major lessons of the civil rights movement that Dr. King was attempting to communicate okay. is like through a boycott, a rich person is not rich if we do not recognize their dollar. Right. No one has authority if we don't follow their order. Right. Okay. So everything that we saw for four years with Mr. Trump that was an internal processing. Most of those people saw the stimulus and then did not know what to do. I just saw low self-esteem and wanted to go and fortify them and say, "You, okay, you may lose your job. What does that mean? All of our heroes right. took those kind of risks. Exactly. Okay. If you keep your job, then what you just did was teach the community how it can stand up nonviolently with resilience and everybody stay alive. We're acting as if the people around us can't grow. We're acting as if Bezos can't grow. We're acting right. as if Branson can't grow. We're <laughs> acting as if Trump can't grow. They can. <laughs> It's but we have, to imagine. Insist, we have to insist on that. Just, just like every mother knows their child can grow, every father knows their child can grow, these people around us are not fixed. They're not fixed. They're constantly growing and moving. We can help them grow. So I spend the great 99% of my time with that kind of message going out. Well, the other message is pro wrestling, but that's off topic. <laughs> 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 You gotta let the, you gotta get it out somehow, right? <laughs> yes, you know, yes, 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 yes. Cause we're finally back on tour. Thank you, Vince McMahon. We're finally out of the studio and back on tour. <laughs> <laughs> nice, sweet. So let's see how how other things. Uh, what about your Facebook page? You want me to throw that up here? Oh uh, yes, um, I'm off my 30 day ban. Okay. Uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, because of the nature of the subject that I subjects that I encounter, I have not found a way to say it more humanely than I say it, or more compassionately than I say it. And so the algorithm will shut it down or wow. shut my page down periodically because I will not um, do like YT instead of W-H-I-T-E. I okay. believe that normalizing, uh, talking about race and that my white friends and family have been treated through a racial lens all the days of their lives is a part of the medicine. That's coming from uh, Dr. Resma Minikam 
out of Minneapolis with his book uh, on intergenerational trauma, My Grandmother's Hands, and addressing that. Okay. You can't solve a character flaw, personality flaw, public policy flaw without openly talking about it. Right. And so my wife, friends, and family have been treated like white people all the days of their lives, but they're walking around in absolute denial that that is true because okay. it becomes complicated. And I get some of the emotions, not all of them, because I'm not having the experience. Right. But I get some of the emotions because now it starts seeming like, well, have people been fake in front of me? No, but they have been trying to survive you. See, the issue is like the Karen who melted down with Victoria's Secrets. If people of color do not cater to white people's emotions, they may be killed, even now in 2021. Now, I'm getting the impression that doesn't feel good. That doesn't feel good at all. So when you encounter persons such as myself who, forgive me for saying it, I don't give a damn. I'm going to treat you like you're human regardless to whom or what. You can try and kill me if you want to. That, that fell at the Million Man March. That was the whole thing for us to get over that fear right. that if we stand up as ourselves, white right. people are just going to shoot you down. Well, no. No, okay. no, no, no. They did shoot quite a bit of people down, white people have. Right. So right now, when the Victoria um, Karen melted down because the black people around didn't cater to her and the black woman didn't cater to her, this now becomes a teaching moment. You okay. don't ostracize her. You don't exile her. You don't shame her. What you do is give her an alternative way of viewing self. This is a self-esteem, self-identity, self-image issue. It is not your evil. We want revenge. You need to, you know, call on the police state. Oh, I, obviously, right. Yeah, of course that. <laughs> right. We're trying to walk to the next horizon of greater humanity. And right. we want you to tap into that. So what, what, what that means is, like uh, with mental health, okay? Yeah. If black people are constantly dealing with race and white people have not been dealing with race, right. then when we make a reference to depression, are we talking about the same thing? Ah. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> right. Right. And that may be true for a number of elements of our collective humanity. Right. They're not the same reference point. We're seeing this breakdown in Texas over critical race theory, which is a legal thing. It's got nothing to do with society, okay? But they're making it a part of the culture war. Yeah. And now they're starting to change the textbooks because they can't look at Thomas Jefferson and say, wait a minute, maybe we need to look at the DM4 and say, was he a sociopath? How was he able to write beautiful words which are true but not be able to live it out. How come Sally Hemings was in a dark room, a cell that was 14 feet, eight inches long, 13 feet wide, and she had five to six children in that cell. And he would go down and visit her and act as if he was having a romantic oh, relationship with his wife or whatever? That was his Again? wife? No, uh, his wife was Martha. Oh, that's And right. Martha died, so... Um, when he was a uh, French ambassador, uh, little Martha, his daughter, who was 13, came over with her enslaved person. Her enslaved person was Sally Hemings. And when he saw S Sally Hemings, he fell in love with Sally Hemings. And Thomas Jefferson was like 42. Okay. So when they came back from France um, toward the end of Washington's second term, Sally Hemings was three, four months, five months pregnant with the first child and the first child's name was Thomas Jefferson Jr. And literally nobody could tell that Thomas Jefferson Jr. was biracial, oh, yeah. he, he could pass. Yeah. So he advocated for his little brothers and sisters to receive emancipation and the only enslaved persons that Thomas Jefferson emancipated were his own children. Oh. Now the whole idea that his children were enslaved oh. is like some really twisted Heath Ledger playing the Joker stuff, man. Hey, okay. <laughs> okay. And that's the paradox of the founding fathers. Okay. So now it's real easy to just condemn them right. as evil. Yeah. It's totally different to try and reconcile what was going on in their minds and for the next 
six generations because that mindset doesn't break until the civil rights movement. Right. See, it's hard yeah. for me. I, hearing it from you, it's easier because when I read this story of Jefferson and I didn't know the whole story like you're telling, I was like, every time I tried to make a, an excuse in my head, I was like, here I am making an excuse for him. And should I be making any excuses? And then here you are trying to put yourself in the shoes and doing it. And I'm realizing, yeah, I mean, we got to look at where we came from and who these people really were to understand where we're going. Yes. Yes. And then we know how to heal. Okay. Yep. So you've got this person named Brene Brown who's running around helping a lot of people get over the trauma inside of their, their immediate personality. Mm -hmm. So the trauma that came from their childhood. How do you get over that, right? And so what we end up teaching is the same techniques that you use to get over heartache, yes. you can get used to get over your racial trauma. Nice. It's the same medicine. Wow. You, we're acting like, you know, John Hopkins has a different book. Right. Okay? The, 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 the principles of the human body, if you're a bone specialist, or a lung specialist, mm -hmm. or a heart specialist, they okay. don't change. It's right. the same book of medicine. Right. What changes is your specialty. You just know more about how to apply that book to a heart, yeah. how to apply that book to bone marrow, how to apply that book to lungs. But it's the same medicine. Likewise, when it comes to getting over intergenerational trauma. So let me backtrack a little bit. Okay. Because we're real clear with the trauma that's embedded in native people from the trail of tears, from the right. genocide. Right. We can see the physical violence and my white friends and family, because they can see the violence, it penetrates the culture of individualism. And they can say, oh my God, you would be traumatized. Same what comes down to black people because of the enslavement practices and you can physically see the violence. You're like, oh my God, you, you're, 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 you're traumatized. We do not talk very well about the trauma that's embedded in white people from having done those things. Ah, uh, yeah, true. Right? <laughs> right? So that isn't called post-traumatic stress disorder, or as Resmo would say, persistent traumatic stress disorder, since it's happening every day. Yeah. What my white friends and family are dealing with are what we call pits, perpetrator-induced trauma syndrome. What do we oh, mean by that? Oh, shit. Damn. If you're Rambo and you got a purple heart. Well, no, because you didn't have a purple heart. Let me take that back. Purple heart means you got shot. Yeah. Rambo killed people. He comes back from, from Vietnam and he's dealing with that. We used to call that post-traumatic stress disorder. It's not post-traumatic. He did the killing. In our regular society, Pitts shows up from livestock staff if you're on a farm and you kill 30 cows every week, yeah. you start figuring out that the cows know they're in a death camp. They're not stupid animals. Right. And you know you're killing a sentient animal. Right. When you pull that blade 30 times a week, it starts messing with you perpetrator-induced trauma syndrome. Wow. So we're acting as if Thomas Jefferson was a sociopath when wow. he wasn't. This is great. We're acting as if Andrew Jackson was a sociopath. They weren't. Okay. There was a culture that had to be crafted in America to help these normal human beings deal with what they were doing to other human beings. Right. Mm. Okay. So in an interview... Dr. King was asked about his childhood and okay. when was his first racial experience? His first racial experience was at six years old. He had white friends at four years old, at five years old, at six years old, the white father took his sons and said, we now got to begin teaching you how to be a white person. Okay. 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 If we go to the diaries of the slave masters, it started at six years old. By 12, you had to be able to whip a slave without crying. That was wow. the first rite of passage. Wow, that's fun. Yes. I'll just let, damn. That's uh, The World the Slaves Made by Eugene Genovese. 
Yeah. So man, this we, is intense. This is intense. Right. Comparing those two is hard. As a white person, I've been I've stayed very far away from trying to compare the animal abuse today in America with the factory farming to slavery because you're all you're you're we're, then we're as a white person it could look like I'm comparing you know animals and humans and there's a big difference some people would say you know and there is we're talking about humans and we're talking about cows so but the thing is when you look at it this way you can realize how me personally I can say look I still today am eating meat and I still eat factory farm meat I have a terrible problem with it I hate it it's disgusting but I also have a lot of diet issues and I need to figure out how to eat. Them. So I need to eat meat. I, that's me personally. I, I, but how do I do it without doing it the wrong way? I, I'm in a conundrum. You know, I want to eat fish out of the rivers. Everything's dying. And I'm trying to get become vegetarian, but it's a health factor. And it's just because I was born into the system that tells me, you know, that's how I was supposed to be. I was eating burgers at eight years old. That wasn't my fault that I was eating a hamburger at eight year old. My mom told me to eat the hamburger. So I did it. And it was normalized. So now I'm waking up to it all. And that's how I kind of looked at Je Thomas Jefferson when I read his history. Yes. Yes. Um, and, and good segue. Because the difference between ancient slavery and new world slavery is that farming aspect. Is right. the animal? I'm going to treat you like a farm animal. Right. Fontaine Hughes and his um, recording from the Great Depression is on YouTube. He is like 102, 103 when they do this recording, and he starts off saying that my father, my grandfather was no, my father, yeah, my father was owned by Thomas Jefferson, and he explains how what chattel slavery felt like. You're treated like nothing more than a dog. Right. Okay. So that that really is lots of parallels and like you're saying you are a child you're given a hamburger and you grow up learning that you are a part of a monstrous system yeah what yeah so now how do you cope and act inside of this monstrous system okay because you've got native um societies in alaska where there's so few vegetables you're like how are you guys alive okay because they eat that much meat exactly with berries and a couple of other things, they're right. also adapted to that diet over 10,000 generations, not right. years. Hold on, you hear that? There's a right. difference. They tell them time differently. Right. Not 10,000 years, 10,000 generations. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. So that's a, that's a totally different way of adapting. Um, but once you're able to understand your role and your position and movement in one aspect of our society you really have mastered the entire society because you can take the exact same skill set go over to politics and say okay you guys are trained to do this and trained to do that and you don't know any different you don't know any better exactly. and if we challenge that you start falling apart like marguerite taylor green and matt gates and the rest of them yeah. there's there's nothing quote unquote technically wrong with those persons other than they literally neurological pathways cannot think a different way until yeah. exposed and then it's painful again this is now back to intergenerational trauma when we're asking people to rearrange neurological pathways they feel psychological pain right <laughs> okay right but we're acting like you're not supposed to because of the culture of individualism and you just say, suck it up, buttercup. Yeah. Wait a minute, y'all. Come on, man. Come on, man. They're going to cry. You're supposed to cry. You're <laughs> yes. supposed to crash. That's okay. You're supposed Crying to get depressed. Why? The neurological pathways in your brain are being rearranged. Right. <laughs> okay? It's just like a broken arm. It's got to heal. Yeah. It hurts. Yes. Back to Brene Brown. When we figure out how to heal a broken heart, you use that to heal all trauma, okay? So believing that it's possible is like the number one lesson that I end up having to drill over and over again, that it's possible. We're not stuck. We're not in a rut. It's not guaranteed that we're always going to be dealing with this, just like um, we're not still uh, dealing with direct enslavement. 
Now, as the paradigm shift happens, there is some reconciliation that needs to occur within the white community okay. that is separate from the native community and the black community because okay. the nature of the problem is different. There are ancestors on the white side that did follow the evil orders and participate in the Trail of Tears. What do you do with those ancestors? There are ancestors who followed evil orders and participated in the discrimination of post the Civil War and creating the Jim Crow and segregation. Oh, yeah. What do you do with them? Okay. Uh, in the new book, I tell a childhood story from my childhood of a white Alaskan who was fifth generation. So his family came in during territory times. Okay. And he was saying, I'm just as native as a native person. And I remember I went like, what? <laughs> I was like, you know, I know you, right? And he goes, yeah. Okay. Your grandparents had a store in downtown Anchorage. He yep. goes, yeah. And your father worked that store. Yeah. And he worked that store since he was like seven years old. He goes, yeah. And you guys are very proud of the house that you got from working the store and having your own right. business and capitalism. He goes, yeah. Right. <laughs> so when the civil rights movement was taught in the fifth grade to you, did you go home to your grandparents and ask them what it felt like to have to, under force of law, put up a sign in their store that says, no dogs or natives allowed? And my friend went silent. Uh, and that's when I said, you're not as native as a native person. Bro. Oh, yeah. Okay? But he's got to reconcile that. Right. One. Hurts. Right. Why didn't I think to ask grandma and grandpa? What am I? What's the fear in me? Right. Is it? Is, is there something coming up saying that I don't belong in Alaska, or my family doesn't belong in Alaska? And it's like Native people in Alaska were not put on reservations. Okay. In 1971, the answer, Alaska Native Settlement Claims Act came through, Willie Hensley argued it, and 80 million square miles were given back, quote unquote, given back to Native people. They have a thing that Native was, hospital. Was that good? Was this a good Oh, it was move? very good, it was okay. very good. So they're sovereign. They're oh, sovereign cool. on 80 million square miles. Nice. Um, so they have their own hospital. And nice. as I've told my friends, I have never had any desire to attend the Native hospital. It's their hospital. Yeah. Alaska Federation of Natives happen in Fairbanks and Anchorage alternately each every other year. For three days, when you go to the Federation, you may hear English, you may not hear English. They are among their own people. I have never felt the need to borrow anything Yupik or Nupiak or Athabascan uh, or, or, or Haida or Hlinkit. I'm black. I'm very content with that. Yeah. I don't have to have access to everybody. Right. Okay. And I, I still feel included. I still feel loved. I still feel seen by them. They do not try to oppress white people. Whatever's coming up in my friend who's feeling like, well, you're saying I don't belong. Oh, yeah. That's going to be some stuff that my white friends and family have to reconcile. Right. Everybody true. else isn't dealing with that. Right. Okay. And when the people who are writing the textbooks in Texas look at the history of Texas, because Texas was Mexico. And the reason why Stephen F. Austin and them were going into Mexico was to extend enslavement practices in Texas, in that Mexico right. territory. Yep. And the Mexicans, Michicana, the Mexicans were not having it. That's why you got the Alamo. They fought right. back and said, you cannot bring enslavement here. We right. don't do that. Right. Okay. Right. And the white people were like, Davy Crockett and the rest of them were like, we want slavery. <laughs> that has to be reconciled. Okay. Yeah, yes, <laughs> okay. It, does. And, it has to be reconciled. <laughs> For sure. And you know, that's and, you know, if moving forward with politics, I would say reparations is a huge step. Ah, okay. Whoo, Lord of mercy. Okay, reparations. Now, 
That's a complicated conversation. Okay. From the white centered view, it's fiat money is what we're talking about. Right. That's why Johnson said like $14 billion, which would be about $350,000 for every Eidos, African descendant of slavery. Okay. Um, Haiti is asking for what? 21 million, something like that. Okay. Uh, Jamaica is asking for nine in, 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 in Cuba or some, the other Not Caribbeans are asking money. from Britain, okay? That's white centered dollars. Okay. Um, as someone who have ancestors, like who were traded for three, four hundred dollars uh -huh. or a thousand dollars, I don't want fiat money. Oh, okay. I don't want to be valued through fiat money. Right. Oh. Okay. That that's one. <laughs> so that's so now as soon as we decenter white people from the equation, they're not the cornerstone of the equation. We're not trying to convince white people of, of Jack Diddy. Okay. Yeah. Then the question becomes first, I have these cousins called Choctaw and Manchez, because my family's from Louisiana. Okay. And Louisiana is their land. Yep. So white people have to first off give the land back. Right. I, okay. So then we're gonna have a conversation about reparations. Right. Okay. <laughs> because it was forty acres and a mule. We're talking land. So you're saying well, not fiat. You're saying reparations should be in the form of more. Right. And then so now, if white people don't own the land, then we're not talking about. 40 acres and a mule anymore. Not with white people. That discussion is with our cousins. <laughs> ah. Okay. Right. right? That, 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 that's okay. That front. So then hey. we'll have to have a conversation with the white population that remains in America after our cousins have the land. Yep. <laughs> that, that, that's reality. And that's that's healing is wouldn't that be a great stride towards healing? One more time. Wouldn't that be a great stride towards healing, healing the nation? Tremendous tremendously. Yeah. Tremendously. Because I mean, if we're in Canada, for example, and our native friends and family uh get the land back, mm -hmm. I don't think the Catholic Church is gonna be in Canada. <laughs> hey. Oh well. <laughs> so, so sorry. That makes sense, man. That makes sense, okay? Yeah, that so, does, and that now, might be a good thing too because that's it, it would be a good thing, right? <laughs> so then when we're having a when they're having a conversation about reparations, no Catholic authority is having a conversation with them. That's right. Period. Right. Okay? So likewise, in America, when it comes down to the oil companies, they would not be at the table. Right, exactly. They won't. <laughs> right. The lumber companies, they may not be at the table. You know, those who did the resource extraction and raped Mama Earth, right. the people who messed up the water, why are you going to sit there and fight and try and convince these people who don't think in a manner yet that is holistic to the Earth, why are we going to keep fighting them once we've got the control? So it's not like get rid of everybody, but right. we're going to want to work with those of like minds. Right. <laughs> rather than those who have actively been trying to hurt all of us. Right. <laughs> yeah. Why? Why have them at the table? Why? Why? That's oh, right. that's equality. No, that is not equality. That is equality under a monstrous system that has taught us inequality, just like you getting a hamburger at eight years old. Right. Or anyone who was born in segregation, like my friend and his grandparents at the school, at the, at the, um, at the, with their store. Okay? If you're born okay. in segregation and that's all you knew, I may not want to argue with you right. as we move right. forward. So civil rights movement, who mm -hmm. were the white people who engaged? It was the young who could see yeah. what was going on yeah. and who said, I want to participate in the solution. That's when SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinated Committee, was like, yeah, you can help us with these sit-ins. And those white children were getting treated just as bad as the Negroes at the sit-ins. Yep. Freedom Riders. That one white guy, um, Zwerg, Zwerg, Z-W-E-R-G or Z-W-I-E-G, um, in front of Joe, John Lewis, when he got, he said, 
I will be the first one to go out there. Oh, yeah. He was the first one off the bus. Okay. He took that yeah. whooping instead no. of John Lewis and them. Okay. Yeah. He was oh. in the hospital. Okay. It was the young people who said no. It was the hippies. They dropped out to drop in. What were they dropping out of? White supremacy. What were they right. dropping into? Right. Humanity. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The so the same thing when it comes down to moving forward. Because we're asking people to change their neurological pathways, right. the young people was I was in um talking to um got recorded with uh the Ashland High School. They have a podcast and they were talking about trauma. I got two beautiful 16-year-olds who were in front of me and they asked, What are your uh hopes and what are your despairs? I said, My hopes are you guys. You're 16, you have the least amount of baggage of wounds. Mm -hmm of any American generation. Yeah. My despairs are, you got to deal with those of us who still have those wounds. Yeah. Okay? You got to deal with it. They're finally going into, we're finally well, moving yeah. towards, I got um, a nephew who is quote unquote half Samoan, so he's built like the rock, right? Oh, right. He's black father, Samoan mm -hmm. mother. And in their culture, they have more than one gender and it's completely accepted with roles and everybody grows up knowing this. Right. Yeah. Right now in white American culture, we're just now crashing through that. All right. In the black community, Bayard Rustin, who was gay as gay could be, taught Dr. King nonviolence. Oh, I didn't know the that. father of gospel music, James Cleveland, gay as gay can be. <laughs> Most part choir directors in the black church, gay as gay can be. Yeah. We we huh? The, everybody isn't dealing with this. Right. Okay. They're just not crashing through. So the young people, they are understanding Jew, Jew, uh, gender fluidity. Yes. And the ones who are putting up resistance, we just got to protect grandma and grandpa and say, grandma, grandpa, we love you. Everything's <laughs> going to be all right. You're going to get food, clothing, and shelter. We're going to love on you. We're not going to put you in a nursing home. We're going to take care of you. And my cousins is... On Tuesday, you may see them in male form. On Sunday, you may see them in female form. You'll be okay. <laughs> You're going to be okay, Grandma. Yeah. We're going to laugh about this. We're going to look at your facial expression. Yo, this is great, man. I, I knew this conversation was going to be so great. because We're going to get through this. You're positive. You're so positive and like You're great to our community. Um, this book here. This book here, I'm recommending this to everybody out there. This book, Processing R, R Collective Trauma. What I didn't understand is this R is for, means white people and black. And it's very directed towards white people because I'm reading it and my neurological pathways were changing. It's time for everybody <laughs> to change their neurological pathways. Get this Yes. Book. I'm going to throw all the links down here. Kaoki and hey brother I'm so happy you came on here with me yes thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you um, thank you we are doing a just close out man yes. we are doing a promotion if you are a part of surge stand up for racial justice here in Eugene there is a special promotion right now I am doing some fundraising because of the fires that are happening in southern Oregon we want to keep doing reliefs on the uh, um reservation as well as as the smoke comes in because the bootleg fire is creating its own weather pattern in new york city Three hundred thousand acres are on fire at the present moment and the brave young firefighters i mean it's a forest fire i mean good grief dude you gotta like cut raw earth for three miles straight as a strip to try and prevent the fire from crossing over. Now, I don't know about you, but one, I'm not fighting a fire like that. My tail is going to run like I did north, okay? Because that's that's what? Dude, no. You, that's mama nature. You, you, don't, you don't do that. So um, I would love for them to go to the website on the Unitarians, make a donation. You can also um, get in contact with me. And over uh, this weekend, because it's Selassie weekend, um, I will do a, a promotion of all four titles for $50, shipping and handling included. And uh, I will send that to you, Adam, where you can um, plug in, 
uh, the PayPal. I do have Venmo, but don't 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 hurt me on that one. And I got, <laughs> that's the the babies told me I gotta give them. I got it, and right. I'm confused. And that's what's gonna happen. Good, I got though. Cash App and, and PayPal, but PayPal is the best. So. I look forward to uh, working with you guys, and um, I'm available to do uh, my class, anti-racist uh, Seven Insights into Anti-Racism work. Uh, I can come in and do um, lectures, conversations. Uh, on the 31st, I will be in uh, 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 Lost Valley, Oregon, for their festival, and it's like the first festival um, since the pandemic broke, nice. and we will be having a conversation about intergenerational trauma and how to make a space more warm and welcoming for BIPOC in Oregon. So this is the level of work that we're doing. Those who want to do the deep dive as well as um, tap into the reservoir of humanity that we all know is possible and want to see realized. Come and join us and get held well as you change those neurological pathways. Yeah.